Okay, so this is the second video for artificial intelligence, and it's going to be quite a short one because there's not a great deal to say here. Um, really, it's just a case of um, setting up uh, a kind of structure that we can hang everything else on. The idea of an agent is fairly ubiquitous in AI, um, and I'm going to use what seems nowadays to be the, the sort of standard definition here, which is that it's just a mechanism that can sense its environment and act on its environment. Um, this gentleman here is my creation evil robot. Uh, he's going to enslave the earth and put me in charge, which I'm quite looking forward to. Um, and he can act on his environment as well as sensing what's happening in his environment. And that's it. He's an agent. Uh, and that's our definition of an agent. Now that's a very, very wide definition, and it can be applied to an awful lot of different things. Um, but it really begs two immediate questions, um, because we want to be scientific about this. So we want to think in terms of how we would judge the performance of an agent if we design one. And what's also quite significant in terms of the difficulty um, involved in designing a good AI agent is uh, the environment that it has to operate in. Now by thinking about these things we end up with essentially a standardized structure um, for talking about programming or constructing agents. Um, so I'm going to take these three things in turn. The two points that I need to make regarding measuring performance are firstly that uh, it's going to be a problem specific thing. Now Agents can be incredibly simple. Okay, An email spam filter is an agent. It can sense its environment, which is your mailbox, and it can act on it. It can decide whether to let a piece of email through or whether to send it to a spam photo. And it has a very straightforward performance measure. You want to identify spam. You don't want to say something's spam when it isn't, and you don't want to say something's a real mail when it's actually spam. Um, that's straightforward. Clearly, for a more um, interesting autonomous uh, agent, something like a self-driving car, it's going to be much more complicated. And there you get into significant issues regarding uh, what the actual goal of something like a self-driving car is, um, because its goals can be multiple and they can conflict with one another. So with a self-driving car, you probably want uh, your journey to be safe, you may also want it to be fast, you may want it to be economical, you may want it to take the shortest possible route, taking traffic into account. And these things work against each other in some cases. You can go at 350 miles an hour, um, this may not be very safe. Uh, and I'm sure you can think of plenty of other examples here. But the point is, it's a problem-specific measure. Um, now that speaks to something rather wider in the actual practice of AI. Uh, people would love it if AI really lived up uh, to what we want it to live up to, um, in the sense that it worked all by itself um, and didn't require human intervention in order to get things done. This is not something that happens yet. Basically, any kind of AI that you are going to design is going to require a significant human input, an input of human ingenuity in order to make it work. So that may be uh, one of a whole bunch of things, but the measurement of performance is one of them. It's something that requires human ingenuity to come up with, and your performance measure may have unintended consequences um, in terms of the ultimate behaviour that you get from your agent. We'll have more to say about that later. The second point I need to make here is that any time you design an AI agent, you're generally going to be uh, interested in not instantaneous performance, not just one-off performance, um, but the expected long-term performance of the agent. Now, it's going to be expected because um, AI agents cannot be um, assumed to be infallible or omniscient. Um, they 
will generally be working in an uncertain environment. And so the, the expected performance over time is the best thing um, that you can hope for. Now remember that we're interested in making agents that act rationally. Okay? An example here is that it, it, it would be rational for you to enter a lecture theatre, to attend a lecture, even if the roof falls in on you. Okay? An agent that was uh, armoured and could protect itself from falling roofs would, might be more successful than you, but not more rational. The second point here is that you're interested in long-term performance, and that's essentially because it leads to better approximations for what you would consider to be rational behaviour. Um, I don't think any of you uh, works entirely on the basis of immediate reward. Um, some people may have aspects of that in their behaviour, but as a rule, we exist in the world and we continue to exist without dying because we're trying to um, perform well over the long term. On the subject of the environment in which uh, we design an agent, um, it should be pretty clear uh, that that can have a major effect on the difficulty involved in making an agent effective uh, with, within its world, within its environment. Now, I've got a whole list of things here uh, which are aspects of environments that can affect the difficulty of designing an agent. Then clearly, although it should be clear, that on the left we have an easy environment and on the right we have a harder one. So taking the first point, we are interested in whether an environment is accessible or inaccessible. An accessible environment is generally going to be easier to deal with. An email spam filter has an accessible environment. It has access to everything it needs um, and what it needs is entirely predictable. Um, it doesn't change unexpectedly, it is just the text of your emails. Um, inaccessible environments are of course much more realistic. Uh, you are all operating in an inaccessible environment. You do not have perfect knowledge about what's happening 10 miles away, or maybe even what's happening outside of your current room. Um, and we can come up with similar arguments undoubtedly for everything else on this list. Deterministic environments, the outcome of your actions is clear and uh, you can predict what an action will actually do to the environment. Again, most environments will be non-deterministic. Episodic environments, well, these can be of considerable interest in artificial intelligence. Um, standard two-player games like chess and go and drafts, and uh, there are any number of them, are episodic. You play an episode, you get a reward in the terms of a win or a loss or a draw, and then you get to repeat things. But again, mostly realistic environments will be non-episodic. And we can be interested in whether the environment is static or dynamic. Does it change while uh, you're deciding what to do? Usually environments will be dynamic, um, and that's harder to deal with than a static environment. Similarly, discrete versus continuous. And the final point here is that um, in this course, we're only really going to consider single agents. It gets much more tricky if you want to consider multiple agents, because then you have to uh, ask yourself whether those multiple agents are competitive or cooperative, or are they mixing competition and cooperation, and also whether they're able to communicate with each other. That brings a whole bunch of new issues in, um, and there are other courses in the Tripos that, uh, that will address some of those. Now the third key question to ask about agents is whether there's a sensible way that you can think about structuring them. An agent perceives and acts on its environment. So we have five points here, and the first one is gather perceptions, because agents perceive their environment, and the last one is do an action, because agents act on their environment. But we need to fill the gaps in in the middle. Now I've already mentioned, I think, the idea that we might want our agent to have a working memory. That is, in some sense, uh, going to have to be updated to take account of what's just been perceived. On the basis of what's there and what goal you're trying to achieve, you're then going to want to try and choose an action to perform. And then you're going to want to update the working memory to take account of the fact that you're about to take an action. Now this should be hinting, really, at the fact that this working memory should be containing representations of certain kind of knowledge about the environment and how the actions of the agent affected. 
there's clearly a lot of potential extra complexity that can be involved here depending on the characteristics of the agent's environment. Um, I haven't specifically talked about what happens if new perceptions arrive while an action is being chosen. I haven't specifically mentioned yet how the world might change while an action is being chosen, and so on. The outcome of actions may be uncertain, might be a non-deterministic environment, and we might have multiple interacting goals. Okay, These themes um, seem to be coming up in various uh, contexts, and um, that will continue to be the case. Now, what do we actually want this working memory to maintain if we dissect it a little bit further? Well, we want to be able to represent the current state of um, an agent's environment. We want to know how the environment changes independently of what the agent does, and we want to know how the environment changes as a result of the agent's actions. And we want to be able to represent and reason with knowledge of this kind. Knowledge representation and reasoning is one of the key areas within classical and current AI uh, that people are interested in. So we've picked out two um, key areas there that interact closely with the way in which we might structure an agent. Now, we've also said that an agent may be wanting to achieve one or more goals. So given that we have knowledge representation and reasoning, we want to be able to use that reasoning to work out how an action or a sequence of actions will modify the agent's environment to get it towards a good goal state. And that requires search, because we're searching for sequences of actions based on our knowledge of the environment, and or, because they're somewhat different um, processes, and we'll see more about that later, we may want to be planning, which is essentially the same thing. But within AI, it tends to be a different bunch of algorithms. Now that gives us a kind of core design. Um, just moving on from the bullet points a couple of slides back and um, putting in what we've just discussed about the, um, the nature of the working memory, we get a, a system that looks a bit like this. Uh, perception comes in. That allows us to update working memory because working memory has a description of what we think the environment is like, a description of how it's affected by actions, and a description of how it will behave regardless of our agent's actions. We use that along with a description of our goal to infer what to do next, and whatever we do potentially then involves updating the working memory to take account um, of how we think that action will uh, change the environment around us. Now, when I speak of goals, in this context, I'm really just referring to some particular state of an environment that is regarded as a good one or um, a, a target one uh, for the agent to get itself into. And I've already noted that for something complicated like a self-driving car, um, there may be multiple goals that interact with, the, with each other. It may be the case that you have multiple goals um, that achieving simultaneously some subset of them altogether is significantly better than attaining any of the goals individually. So the quality of getting to a bunch of goals may not just be additive in terms of the individual goals themselves. And similarly, they may conflict. Um, getting one goal achieved may actually be detrimental in terms of achieving another goal. And that introduces um, a bunch of complication. Now, I mentioned that uh, one of the, the key inputs from um, economics uh, to AI has been the idea of um, the utility function and uh, designing behaviours to maximise expected utility. Now that is an alternative uh, to thinking about goals specifically in terms of just a state of the environment. A utility function would map a state to a number representing its desirability. And there is an entire theory behind how to design good, effective utility functions, um, which can be expressed, for example, in terms of looking at preferences between uh, goal states. And one approach to modern AI is in terms of maximizing expected utility over time. Um, again, that is, a, uh, that is one major way that leads to a bunch of rather different algorithms from the ones that this course is going to discuss. 
um, and I'm not going to have time to talk about it in detail in this course. There's one major thing that we still need to add um, to the fundamental kind of structure for thinking about agents, and that's learning, because learning is a big deal right now. It always has been, and we would generally want uh, anything that we consider to be an intelligent agent to learn from its experiences. Now, that involves two further things. The first is a source of feedback. Our agent has, in some sense, um, to get from its environment some indication of whether it's doing the right thing or not. There are quite a lot of different ways in which this can happen. And yes, there are also um, approaches to machine learning that don't require that kind of feedback. Um, so we'll see how this pans out in due course. The second thing that's needed is a way in which that feedback can be used to update uh, any of the um, constituent parts of the, the agent, really. Uh, the learner section of the agent can update the working memory, um, or uh, the description of the goals that are trying to be achieved, or the way in which inference is done. These are all perfectly good targets for learning. Um, but we might really want to look a little more about what this entails, because it leads to, in particular, quite an important trade-off. The important trade-off that's introduced um, is really uh, one of how we generate new behaviour in order to make learning effective. What does that mean? Well, let's say our agent is existing within its environment and it's doing quite well. It's, uh, it's producing actions, it's um, achieving goals or maximising expected utility up to a point, um, and uh, it may be that we're basically happy with how it's doing, or it may be happy with how it's doing. The question is this, does it exploit the fact that it's doing okay? Does it just keep going in order to um, attain goals to the level um, that it's currently capable of attaining them? Or does it explore? And the idea here is that by trying actions that wouldn't usually uh, try to do if using its current behaviour to um, work at its current level, it may in the short time be less successful. Okay, Trying new things may make you less successful, at least over the short term. But the payback there is that by trying new things you may find better ways of doing things in the long term. So there's a key trade-off in machine learning within AI, of exploitation versus exploration. It's, it's particularly important um, within the context of reinforcement learning. Um, now, I'm not going to say anything more about that just for now, um, but we'll, we'll maybe revisit some of that later.